Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to give the crowd another few minutes to show up and then we'll get going. So please mute yourself if you're not talking and thanks for coming. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Welcome. My name is Jessica Waybright, and I, along with Lincoln Draper, Holland Hardy, and Jessica Krischels, are co owners of Remark Print Workshop here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we're delighted to present our eighth annual international juried print exhibition. Today we have our first of our artist talks, Deanne Prozia. And I'm going to read a little bit about Deanne, and then I'll let her talk, and we'll show her beautiful work, and then you don't have to listen to me. Again, please um, mute yourself if you're not talking. Thank you. Deanne L. Prozia, born in Chicago, studied at Northern Illinois University, DeKalb, Illinois, and the Art Institute of Chicago. She has lived in Kentucky, Connecticut, and currently in New Jersey. For three years, she lived in Germany, where she had two one-person shows. She has been listed in marquee who's who of American artists and is represented at the old print shop in New York City and by several print dealers. Prozia is the Vice President of the Society of American Graphic Artists and a member of the Boston Printmakers, the Allied Artists of America, elected member, the Audubon Artists Associate Member, Asso American Women's Artists Associate with Distinction, Silver Mine Guild Art Center, the Center for Contemporary Printmaking, and the Print Club of Albany. She has won many awards for her work, including the American Women Artists Award of Recognition for Best Composition and the Award of Excellence, the Catherine Lor Lorillard Wolf Arts Club Gold Medal for Graphics, the, oh my, now I've lost my place, <laughs> the Allied Artists of America Silver Medal on, of Honor for Graphics, Art Times Award for Graphics, Pacific States Biennial National Printmaking Exhibitions Jur Jurors Award from juror Willie Cole and the Society of American Graphic Artists, Speedball Purchase Award from juror Richard Estes. Her etching under the elevated is in the permanent collection of the Rockwell Museum, a Smithsonian affiliation in Corning, New York. Other etchings are in the collections of the New York Public Library, New York, New York, uh, Newark Public Library, Special Collections, New York, New, Jer New Jersey, Rutgers University, University Collection, New Jersey, Syracuse University Arts Collections, Syracuse, New York, the United H York, <laughs> sorry, the New York Historical Society Museum and Library, New York City, the Graphic Gallery Fund Collection, Varna, Bulgaria, um, Unt Art Museum, Spokane, Washington, among others. And with that, Deanne, please take it away. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, like Jessica said, my name is Deanne Perosia, and I am a printmaker. I do line etchings. Um, I went to school at Northern Illinois University, and I was majoring in art. Um, but then I switched over to advertising. And then after school, after I graduated, I was um, really wanting to get back into art. And uh, luckily, I worked right across the street from the Art Institute of Chicago, so I started taking classes there. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I wasn't really interested in painting. And so I decided that what I wanted what I should do is, um, well, actually what happened is I went to the mall. Uh, I had to go and get something. I was at the mall and there was a weekend art show there. And so I went there and there was a printmaker there and I walked right into his booth and I said, this is what I want to do. And this is the printmaker, Phil Thompson. And he said to me, I'll teach you, just come to my studio. And I said, okay, perfect stranger, I will come to your studio and learn about printmaking. So I went three times and I took copious notes and I went home and the first thing I did was buy a printing press. So um, because Phil taught me everything about printmaking and he did uh, architectural scenes of um, Chicago and of ballparks, I felt that I could not do that. So what I did was I started to focus in on my grandmother's photo albums. And so I started to reproduce these um, prints of, of her um, photographs. And this is one called Kermit and Dale, Dale that her brothers when they were young. And of course, uh, during that time, it was the 90s and everything um, you know, that was popular was the barns and things like that. So I started to do also barns and, and stables. This one's a two, two by two inch um, piece called Stable. So 
So um, after a while, I thought, you know, I want to see if I could do water, you know, if I could, um, you know, accomplish getting water, you know, representing water. So I took this picture. This is the Wabash Avenue Bridge overlooking the Chicago River. And I decided that, um, you know, I, and I did this and I put it in the weekend art show and it did so well that I decided forget it. Uh, you know, forget my rule about not doing architecture because it really sold, I think I sold eight of them. So um, a few years after that, uh, we moved, we moved to Kentucky, but then we moved to Connecticut where everything was really adorable. So I started doing etchings of um, things like lighthouses and this is on Block Island. And then uh, after that, we went to, um, I started traveling. We went over to Europe. And so I started doing images of Europe and this is Florence. So uh, this next piece is called Rotenberg Marketplace. And I climbed all the way up into the tower and took this picture with my wide angle lens. And I thought it you know, worked out great, but you could really see the bend of the wide angle lens. And I, I kind of wanted to see if I could eliminate that or, or fix that. So what I ended up doing was I would take pictures, like this next piece, I would take pictures and then put them together. And then I would put a frame around the middle, which next. And then all I would have to do is kind of fix some of the things that weren't, um, you know, kind of working out like the chairs at the bottom. And that's where I had the yellow arrows. And then I did an etching and it turned out like this. And this is called Paris Cafe. So I started uh, really kind of taking pictures and cutting pictures and putting them together. And for this one, I would, um, fo anytime I, this is Grand Central, and anytime I would focus in on the entrance, the background would get really washed out. And anytime I would focus on the, you know, buildings up top, the entrance would get very dark. So I, this, the yellow line represents where I cut the photos apart and then glued them together. And then I did this, uh, it ended up looking like this. And it kind of forced the perspective a little bit, and I, I really enjoyed uh, doing that. So this is a 12 by 12 inch piece called Homebound. Um, you know, because Phil Thompson, he taught me everything I knew about doing etchings. He just taught me all about line etching. So in the beginning, I, you know, that's all I knew. I wasn't really familiar with all the different types of printmaking. And, but I would eventually start seeing aquatints. And this is an aquatint. And, and the inset is a close up. And I just was fascinated. I was like, how do they do that? Uh, you know, the, they must be the master of lines. I don't understand how, how they could do that so well. So I would, um, I came up with this uh, technique, not really a technique, but a thing that I did was, which is cross hatching. And so on my plate, I would do these little cross hatches all throughout my entire plate. And that penny is there just so you can see how small um, my, my cross hatching is. And then uh, the dark areas is where the plate has been in the acid bath already. And then the brighter areas is where I would just worked. And so after this, I would print it. And then this is a close up, but this would turn into one more, this. So, and it's all cross uh, hatching. And then here's another example. So this one, it's close up, turned into this. So I started to do um, more uh, scenes of New York City because I, I had a gallery there and, um, you know, I joined some uh, groups there and stuff like that. And I loved architecture, so of course New York was perfect. So I was doing uh, scenes like this and people were really just, they would come up to me. I was doing the weekend art shows for a long time, 25 years I did them for. 
and people would come up to me and they would go, oh, I know this place, you know, my, my uncle's shop is down the, the street, or I used to go and get donuts, you know, over there or, you know, whatever. And they would just tell me these stories about the places and it would, you know, kind of annoy me because after a while I was like, yeah, I'm doing artwork and I'm, you know, I wanted people to really focus in on the work. And so I started to do these pieces that were still recognizable, but not as recognizable. And people started to really look at the patterns and uh, the textures and stuff, and they, they became more interested in that. So I did this piece. This is called Under the Elevated. And then this is my most recent piece. And it's um, you know a little more abstract, and it's called Overhead Web. And that's it. Well, thank you, Deanne. Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. I have a question. Go ahead. The, uh, the last piece, Deanne, what size is that? That is so beautiful. Oh, thanks, Grace. <laughs> it's about um, nine by seven, I believe. Wow. So, yeah, and it takes, oh, the question I get asked all the time, my number one question is, uh, how long did it take you to do that? And so a piece that is about um, the 12 by 12, the under the elevated, is about 200 to 250 hours. And so the overhead web was probably around 150 hours. Mm. Um. Deanna, and, go ahead. I was just wondering um, how often, I know this is, you can't answer this entirely, but like on average, how often is your plate going into the acid? Like how many, how many rounds of etching are you doing? Well, actually, I can't answer that. Right. <laughs> so so um, I, basically, I have five values. So I put it in five times, and I work on the darkest areas first. And I'll put that in for about 20 minutes or so. And then I take it out, and then the next, I, you know, I work, you know, to the lighter, the lightest one. And I will put that in five times. Then I, I take it out, and I clean off my plate, and then I print it. And I go, oh, that's terrible looking. And so then <laughs> I have to put the ground on it and rework the whole plate again. But um, that second session or whatever doesn't take as long. It takes maybe a few more weeks. So, yeah. So I had a question about the, um the lighthouse and the duomo one are, do you have a texture in the background or is that all plate tone it is all cross hatching all line okay. so there's no no plate tone uh no aqua tint or anything like that wow. so yeah all of it is line it just i don't know why i've decided to continue doing that but <laughs> it's very relaxing because you do get to look at every single thing in your picture <laughs> I have another question. What's yeah. the difference between a, a mono print and a, you said an aqua print, that one of the pieces that you showed was an aqua tint? What's a, what is a mono print? Oh boy. So, um, okay. So a mono, there's a mono print and a mono type. And I, okay. and I always get confused on which is which, and maybe somebody else will know how to answer better. I think the monotype is one of a kind, like you just do one and that's it. And a mono print um, is where you can uh, like lay down some ink on your plate and run it through the press, but then you can kind of add to it and make a smaller addition maybe. Is that right? Does anybody know? I, I, no. can, I can clarify a little bit. Okay. Um, so monotype is a specific uh, genre of printmaking. And so that is when you paint on a plexiglass plate, or for example, and transfer the image to the paper. That's it. You might have some um, ink left over on your plate that you can work back into and add more ink to it. As, so that's monotype. It's its own thing. 
And then a mono print is a plate, a one-off print that you make out of a plate that you can make multiples of. So if you took one of your etchings and did um, a la poupée or inked it up a special way or did it in a whole bunch of different colors, each one of those would be a mono print. But um, they're not monotypes because it's based from an etching plate. If that clears it up or makes it more confusing, I don't know. A little of both. <laughs> I just don't know anything about any of this. It's so foreign. I think it has a, a mother or a matrix. We call it a matrix. And so there is a plate that is, uh, the image is the same and, um, and then it can be reproduced. Yes, for a mono print. For yeah. mono print, right. Yes. Yeah, if if I can add to this, um, please, because these are these are all good answers. Uh, simply, a monotype is a is a one off of a, a a smooth plate. Typically, a mono print is off a matrix, in which, when you defined it as you can take a plate that's been etched and ink it differently, I wouldn't call those mono prints per se. Those are just different variations on the plate. But if you, for instance, paint on a print or paint on a plate and print that, that could be a mono print. You're not inking it differently. You may just ink the matrix all the same with black ink. And then you go in with uh, hand painting onto the plate or hand painting onto the finished print, which I've done where I've done colored pencil on, a, on, a, on an etching. Um, so it's, it's, it is how you alter that, uh, the plate uh, to, to, to define it as a mono print. It's, That's true. Uh, that's versus, true. I did an oversimplification. Versus, versus an yeah. EV, an edition verité, where it's just a different uh, alliteration of that particular plate by inking it. So that complicates even more, I suppose. Yes. That's <laughs> I didn't know I had such a complicated question. <laughs> oh print, printmaking is, can be very complicated, and, and that's part of it. As a printmaker myself, you are spending a lot of time explaining the process to other people, which is great because Printing isn't just, printmaking isn't just the, the final image. It's the process, also part of the art. And, and to explain it, it does really help a lot of people who look at your work and they understand what's, what, what the results, how you get to that point. It's yeah. very interesting. That, that is true because I did weekend art shows for 25 years and I really felt just like an educator more than anything because everybody wanted to know what this was, that people thought they were photographs and, and I, I ended up putting up a little, um, you know, sign explaining the process because I got so tired of saying it over and over again. So when you, when you bring a same thing, when I've done festivals, I would bring my some of my plates, and just the fact of showing a plate to a person, they're just astounded by yeah. the, the 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 transformation from a metal plate to this piece of paper. Um, and, and, and by the way, Dan, I want to really compliment you on your work. It's when I first saw it, um, I actually zoomed in to say, how does she get those values? <laughs> and then I saw that those values were done line by line. And, and I'm an, I, I do aquatint, but uh, um, I really appreciate, obviously, the amount of work that goes into uh, creating your, your values on your images. The images themselves are great, but just uh, the technique that you've developed is uh, astounding. So... Thank you. Thank Kudos. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, Deanne, can you say a little bit about the difference between your um, cross hatching and, and aquatint in, in terms of how you get shading? Yeah. So an aquatint. At any time I would explain an aquatint to people, I would always I always explain it as a the spray. There's a couple different ways to do an aquatint, but I would explain the spray paint aquatint just because people would understand that the best. So um, basically it's, um, you take a plate and you take a can of spray paint and you just like spray just like lightly, you know, maybe, I don't know, a few feet from it, just really lightly back and forth. And all the paint droplets will <clears throat> settle on the plate, but they won't be touching. You know, if you zoomed in on them, you would just see them as dots. And so when, then when you put it in the acid bath, the acid goes in between all the dots and around. And then if you were to print it, it would be a black plate. And then uh, people would burnish off, you know, you could burnish off and stuff. Now, my, I don't do that at all. And for the um, tone, I would just do the um, cross hatching. 
And so uh, it's all the same. The cross hatching isn't like uh, tighter in some areas or looser in the other areas. It's all the same. It's just the amount of time it's in the acid bath. So the darkest um, are about an hour, maybe around an hour, the first run through or whatever. And the lightest end up being four minutes. Um, I used to do six, but I got a new acid bath, you know, and so I moved and I bought new acid. And so, you know, I had to figure that all out. So it's about four minutes. But then when I uh, put the ground on the plate again to do a second, you know, to fix some things or make things darker, when you put the ground on the plate, uh, sometimes it doesn't go all the way down into the groove, the previous groove. And the acid can work its way down into those grooves and that will make it darker, an area even darker. So does that make sense? Am I explaining that okay? So, it, so that darkest line will end up being maybe an hour and a half. Deanne, we have a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Do you ever use other types of print techniques such as woodcut or lino cut? Or does relief not appeal because you are attracted to the detail achieved in aquatint and etching? Well, I, I, I have to say, I really love woodcuts. I think they're beautiful. I, I just, I'm very envious. I would love to do that. But I don't do anything but the line etching because, and I, because it takes me so long. I only do four a year. And so I feel like I really don't have much time to do anything else. <laughs> so, and they're so um, detail oriented that um, I actually do do some ceramic work, but, and some watercolor, but they're much looser. So it's kind of like my, uh, my escape from, from, you know, having such detail in my, my etchings. Uh, Deanne, uh, Pat Pitcher here, and your work is absolutely amazing, and I don't know much about etching at all. Um, and so what type of tool do you use to get those fine marks? Well, oh shoot, I should have grabbed my tool. So basically I use a, um, hang on, let me just grab it. Um, it's right here. So this is what I use. And um, this is, I think it's a potter's tool. Uh, Cause when I was starting a long time ago, I didn't, I wasn't really familiar with every, anything. And so I just went to the art store and I went, oh, this seems like this would work. So, um, Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, so this is what I started using. And I'll have to tell you, after so many uh, years, just this year, the, the point started to get dull. And so I sharpened it and it almost sharpened it like too sharp. So I'm trying to, uh, so now I'm starting to use this, which is, which is similar. So does that, Answer. Yeah, that's great. Are, are you scratching into actual metal or is it a some type of polymer on top of a metal or what exactly are you scratching into? So I have a, a copper plate and it is a 16 gauge. So it's a very thick copper plate and I um, put a coat of ground on top. And so just think about ground as a real thin coat of wax and it's a ball ground. And I put the ball ground onto the plate and I, the plate's on a hot plate. And then I melt the ground on there and then I roll it. So it's very thin. So think of the, it like a thin coat of wax that you could scratch off with your fingernail. And then I take the, the needle and I draw my image into the ground, through the ground to the plate. And I have to do everything in reverse. And I only start with the darkest areas first. And then I do my cross hatching and I put it in the acid bath and then I take it out and then I work on the next lighter areas and then I put it back in the acid bath and I take it out and I do that five times and uh, until I get to my lightest areas. And then I wipe off the ground and I ink up the plate and I put it through a printing press with a damp piece of paper on top 
and I get a print. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, so that's all. <laughs> impressive, impressive. Thank you for, for teaching me that. I appreciate that. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Uh, Sheena, did you have a question? Please unmute yourself and ask if you'd like to. Hi, hello, Diane. Hi. Um, well, I'll just undo my video. Okay. Hi, Diane. Thanks for. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, hi. Thank you very much, and thanks for. The, to the group for inviting me. Um, yeah, I just wanted, I, I wrote a small thesis there in the chat and then Megan was very handy to get back to me there. Um, basically, I wanted just to say that um, it's very admir admirable the way you got your cross hatching and to improvise your the aquatint um, e effect. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really lovely, it's a lovely way of um, applying tone. Um, however, many times you put it, you put the plate and um, into the acid, and so it's it's yeah, it makes for a much more interesting aquatint um, as opposed to the 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 usual um, powder aquatint and m without the lines. So it's a very nice addition. And the other thing um, um, was. In my experience in, as a printmaker, uh, with monotype and monoprint, um, they're basically they're mono means one, and so they're basically one-off prints, often across you know I'm based here in England now, and um, just throughout my work as a printmaker, mo in my eyes and in many of the published print publishers and, and dealers, there's a, a wealth of confusion between monotype and monoprint. And um, basically, different people call a monoprint a monotype and vice versa. So it's utterly confusing for the lay person, never yeah. mind another printmaker. And um, But basically, it just means it's unadditionable. It's, it's a one-off. And anyway, your your drawings are, are great, and I, I love the way you've you've added that extra tone to your works, Diane. And I, yeah, sorry, go on. That's for, That's all I wanted to say. Thank thank you. That's very nice. And thanks for joining us from what is it like two in the morning or something? Uh, no, it's um. I was just saying to Megan that um, I know I'm here in Bristol. I'm based in Bristol now in England, and um, I I. And basically, I, I was just, I, I've just done another Zoom meeting, but with music. So I think that might have been the problem with the, with the mic there, but it's sorted out now. So I'll just erase that entire chat that I wrote because um, it's <laughs> no use now. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> continue as you do play. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, if that's it, I guess we'll say thank you very much, Deanne. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I, the show is great. And so thank you for letting me be part of it. Well, thank you so much for, for submitting. We're really just totally in love with your piece. And um, I'm so glad that you volunteered to be first in our talk series, because it's really, this is really, I mean, having all this beautiful work in the gallery is obviously really cool but this has been such a delight in this terrible pandemic to have this connection with um, artists from all over and so thank you so much Deanne and thank you everybody who came this evening and please tune in we'll have our next talk is going to be January 9th and if I was smart I would have queued up who's scheduled but I don't have it in front of me so please keep an eye out on Facebook and our um, email list, if you're not on it, go ahead and get on it on our website and we'll let you know um, as they come up. And, uh, oh, I should put the website, how about if I put the website in the chat and then you guys can see more there. All the work is online as well.
actually apparently I can't spell and talk at the same time. So chat amongst yourselves. Uh, uh, Deanne, one, one other technical question, just curious. Uh, yeah. The acid, do you use a Dutch mordant or do you use the uh, iron? I use a uh, ferric chloride. Okay. So, yeah. So it's... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still old school. <laughs> yeah, that's scary stuff. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I, I, I manage fine. I've been doing it for several years. I don't inhale over my acid baths. That's, uh, that's a secret right there. Yeah, yeah, I've actually, I've had to get, uh, I have a whole fan system and everything, so, but, you know, somebody told me that uh, you could splash it and it could splash in your eye, and y your eye would be yellow, but you wouldn't die or anything, so I thought, right. oh, that's good enough for me. <laughs> nice to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. You probably shouldn't drink it, but you probably, you might be fine if you do. <laughs> oh, there were, um, I, I belong to a, uh, a print society called California, California Society of Printmakers. Um, and I, there was somebody who submitted work recently. They did it incorrectly because he was from uh, Bakar and he, he nominated himself as an honorary member. So we can't accept that. But I, I went to his website and he had some short videos on his techniques. I, I like his work, but he would be, be pouring acids and solvents down his sink. And I said, well, that, that's not particularly good. So that was always a problem with printmakers is what to do with all the effluence of our yeah trade. i actually used one uh gallon of acid for like 10 years wow. yeah. and i just uh, yeah, but i used it hot i didn't mix it with water ever so it just kept uh, it just kept working and so when i moved just moved uh, recently a couple of years ago i i you know i had to pour it all back into the container and and then add some so it changed so i had to like re-figure out how how long everything took, but um, yeah, that, it, usually I'll put it down or I'll put baking soda in it. If, when, when we moved to Germany, I had some over there. It was different. It was like in a container and then you added water and you mixed it. It was weird. Uh, it worked, but it was got kind of got pasty. And, and then I put a bunch of baking soda and wrapped it up and tossed it, but hopefully that was the right thing to do. So. Baking soda works. Yeah. 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 Thank you again for your work. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Sure. All right. Thanks again, everybody. All right. Hi. Thanks, Deanne. You're welcome. Thank you.